money has become quite an important one, judging by the number of videos on YouTube. So today we're going to talk about money. And to help us with that is Mr. Don Richards, who, with his partner, Sue Hamill, have founded Positive Money New Zealand. Don, welcome to the program. Thanks, Dick. Yep, good day. Perhaps uh, you could start by giving us a bit of background about your organization. Well, Positive Money New Zealand is it was based on Positive Money UK, which started out about five years ago. And the intention was to reform the banking system. Um, and we attended a documentary on uh, the secret of Oz and we, Sue and I, were so upset about what we heard in the documentary about how the banks had been creating money and buying up uh, properties through boom and bust cycles that we decided we had to do something about it, that um, we were becoming, or New Zealand as a whole, were becoming debt slaves to the bank, quite literally. And we didn't know where to start, so we approached Positive Money UK and they allowed us to use a lot of their material and we uh, adopted their name. And so we've been uh, around for about three and a half years and our intention is to stop private banks from creating money out of thin air and charging compounding interest to you and I for the privilege of using money they don't have. It drives up property prices, it creates all sorts of distortions in the market, and it actually is one of the key reasons why we have inequality, child poverty, very expensive housing. So, you know, it was one of those decisions where you you actually sit down and say, right, I've got to do something about this. And Sue and I created Positive Money New Zealand, and we've been growing the conversation ever since. That's great. Um, a lot of people uh, in, in the public generally don't know much about money, about how it's created, or what this role is in society. Um, can you run down kind of generally what money means? I mean, it's obviously a means of exchange, but what other kinds of things, what role does it play in our society? Well, it's become a commodity in and of itself. So rather than it just being a means of exchange to actually buy and sell goods, we now have people speculating in the cost of money and uh, people hedging against the cost of money. So the financial system is actually three or four times greater by worth than the actual real economy. The real economy is where physical goods get bought and sold. So that's where you and I do most of our work. We work in the real economy, and then there's the financial economy, which is where you have speculation, where you have money creation out of thin air, and all sorts of sleight of hand that distort prices and create all sorts of problems. There's boom and bust cycles and housing becomes unaffordable simply because private banks are able to create money out of thin air and then lend it to you and I at interest. Um, are those the main uh, problems that we have with the current system? Well, it, it transfers wealth from those who uh, create the goods and services to those in the financial industry who speculate and accumulate. So um, there is no control over the amount of money that gets created. So banks can keep on lending money to you and I so long as we believe that you have to get in the property ladder, that you have to start somewhere. And that continues to drive up prices. And a lot of the money is going into property and not very much is going into the real economy where businesses actually need to invest and buy and sell. So businesses have to pay a premium for the 
money they lend from the banks. And that's where the economy really, the real economy works. But because a lot, it's just sort of like 80% of the money is being siphoned off into housing, the um, business community is being starved of funds. Do you know of any systems that work better than ours? We had a, a system similar to what we we're proposing back in the 1930s, coming out of the Great Depression. The um, Labour Party, the first Labour Party, nationalised the Reserve Bank and created a lot of the money to build the state houses themselves. And then they put that into the economy and real jobs were created real assets were created and those assets are with us even today they they used it to fund the planting of Kayangaroa State Forest so the government rather than private banks can actually create our money supply at little or no interest to us and so the economy will boom people will get meaningful jobs and um, the tax burden will start to get uh, evenly shared out. If we can take a lot of the money out of the financial market, property speculation, then the cost of housing will plateau. It will not continue to rise simply because there's not the money being injected by the banks to push up the prices. Um, the problem deck that I have is that my daughter has a student loan. Um, she's 25 and she's got a $30,000 student loan and she wants to get married. She wants to buy a house. She's told she has to save for her retirement and there's just physically not enough money to do all of those things. So she's either going to have to give up on the dream of owning her own house or she can't afford to save for her retirement, or, uh, you know, she's uh, her choices are slim, and she's going to be in debt for the rest of her life. And that's not the legacy I'm going to hand on to my kids. Indeed. Um, why, why did we get off the old system that sounded like it was working so much better? Well, it was dogma, really. It was um, economists came up with a great idea, take government out of business and allow the market to decide. Now, if we had a benign market that looked after everyone, that might be a good idea, but the market looks after the market. The market will drive up prices so that it maximizes its profit. And so all our banks have been sold off, apart from a Taranaki Savings Bank and Kiwi Bank. So we have no local owned banks, apart from some very small ones. Um, a lot of our business has been sold off overseas, telecoms been sold off and the likes. And the market really looks after the market. You see that with the energy prices the prices of electricity keep on going up. And yet we have infrastructure there in the way of dams and the like that the value of them is not going up. But we've got this crazy valuation model that says it reverse engineers things that says if you're making this amount of profit, then the asset that creates that amount of profit is worth this much. So it's just crazy, and electricity is a necessity. People are going without warm housing, just so the market can gouge more money out of the people of New Zealand. So we're being hit by all sides. The market will look after the market. We cannot allow market forces to dictate how 
the New Zealand lifestyle is going because it's going the wrong way and the current government is just digging deeper into the hole thinking, I know if we sell off the last of the state assets, if we encourage more overseas companies to come in here and set up and send their profits overseas, that's going to work because it hasn't worked in the past. We'll try and it's probably because we haven't sold everything. So we're on a race to the bottom and it's not working. So so we say stop and look at other alternatives. Now this is just not our idea. This is not something we've joined up, dreamed up. It's something that's been endorsed by the IMF in a discussion paper that was put out in 2013, I think, called the Chicago Plan Revisited. And they say if the government issues our money supply, it will energize the economy, it will pe put people into work, it will eliminate boom and bust, and the economy itself will grow by a factor of 10% with little or no inflation. So that sounds really too good to be true. But this is the IMF talking about a plan that was initially put before President Roosevelt uh, during the first Great Depression. And he had enough to deal with at the time, so he said, OK, we'll put that on the back burner. And it never actually happened. Now, we also have the Bank of England talking about how money gets created. We have the Financial Times coming out and saying, we need to stop giving money to the banks and we need to start giving it to the people because the banks will only lend out money at interest. And the problem is we're already in debt. How the hell are we going to get out of debt by taking on more debt? This is a race to the bottom. And we say, stop, there is another answer. Are there any other places around the world uh, that have done that successfully? Yeah, uh, Canada. Canada did it um, up until about 1970. They used this sort of money to fund the St. Lawrence Seaway, which is a huge engineering feat, without any interest. And so the Bank of Canada Act actually says the Bank of Canada must loan out money to municipalities and to the states and to the nation free of interest. Now, after the 1980s, we had Reagan and Thatcher and co who had market forces will decide. The problem with market forces is they put the money straight into their pocket. I've already gone over that. But there have been examples throughout uh, the last century. And even, you know, like I say, you just have to look at New Zealand. We came out of the first Great Depression in a better shape than a lot of other nations. It took America until World War Two before there was enough volume in their economy to get out of the depression. So we're just saying there is an alternative and it does work. The, in the States, in the States, there's um, a lot of discussion on the internet about the role of the Federal Reserve. Uh, do we have folks like that that manage our monetary system over here the way that they, the Fed manages the system over in the States? Well, we do have the Reserve Bank, um, which is meant to manage um, our financial um, s status, but all they have at their command is raising interest rates in the hope that that will reduce demand. But it's a very, very blunt tool, and... The banks, it just means the banks get more interest uh, and so they make more profit. They're, they're currently making 
three billion, three thousand million dollars profit a year. Mm. And so if they up the interest rates, people are still going to buy, so they're going to get more money. Um, we say take the ability of private banks to create money out of nothing and lend to us a combined interest. Take that off them. They have shown themselves to be bad stewards and put it back into the hands of the government. Would you say that our system over here and the banks that we have over here, which I assume is uh, Australia and the ASB and banks like that, familiar names, um, are they at all comparable to what's going on in the States with the the large banks and uh, investment firms that are over there? Well, they're not in, involved in any of the, I was going to say swaps or any of the yep. um, ridiculous stuff, but um, they did sell some swaps to farmers um, in the last two years. They said to farmers, okay, you buy this particular financial package and we will set your interest rate at a certain level for 10 years. So the bank, uh, the farmers did and in the fine print it said and we can change the rate if we want to. Mm, great. So the rate went up, the farmers, some of them lost their homes, their farms, and the Commerce Commission actually took the banks to cook to, to, to task, and they fined them about $30 million, which is an insult. It's a peanuts to what they were getting out of this shonky deal. Now, the banks have also been involved in tax evasion. Uh, they were pinged for $2,000 million worth of tax that they avoided paying. Now, this is on top of the money they get from creating money out of thin air. They get huge profits out of that, and it wasn't enough for them, so they actually wanted more. And so don't get conned by this, we're here to help. Don't get conned with, we uh, live in your world. They actually live in Australia. They're not here to help us. They're there to help themselves. See, our currency is one of the top five traded currencies around the world, and yet we're one of the smallest economies in the world. So the banks are making a lot of money in different ways, and while they're still making lots of money, uh, through traditional loans, um, there hasn't been the, the pull for the uh, credit defaults and the asset swaps and goodness knows what else. Uh, there's some discussion in the States about the possibility of the US dollar tanking, that it's, uh, it's, they've got unpayable debt, their credit rating is going to be uh, dropped uh, by rating agencies that are honest, and uh, there is some speculation that the uh, American economy is going to uh, collapse, essentially, um, later this year. How, do you think that we in New Zealand would feel some of the fallout from if something like that were to happen in the States? Absolutely, absolutely. Like I said, the Australian banks are owned by... U.S. and British interests. So if they go down, they may take the Australian banks down with them. And if they go down, we certainly will go down. We are so exposed to outside influences that um, we aren't in control of our own destiny, Dick. We are beholden to events that happen offshore that have no relation to what's going on here in New Zealand. Oh. Well, I have read, um, I was sent a paper that a new uh, proposal for money has uh, recently been floated. It was very similar to the uh, Chicago plan revisited. Um, I'm just wondering 
if you see any daylight for that new plan? Um, I don't know that there'll be much appetite for it in America because the banks do control the purse strings for Congress and the, the, the American government is not aware or they're too scared to challenge the status quo. Now, there are, at a state level, there is some real uh, change going on there, and the leading force there is the Bank of North Dakota. So North Dakota, the government of uh, the state of North Dakota said to the Bank of North Dakota, we will put all our business through you, we will put all our tax money through you, and we will pay all our state employees through you. So essentially the state owned or had a direct interest in the bank. So the bank looked after the state and the state financed a lot of the, uh, what it needed. The money stayed in North Dakota too. So the problem with our current system is a lot of the money that gets made in New Zealand disappears overseas. So we've got a huge arterial bleed. We're bleeding lots and lots of money. Mm. And so with North Dakota, the money stays in North Dakota and other states have seen how prosperous North Dakota is. And they're saying, right, let's have this model for our state banks. So the state banks are actually taking on the model. And this this is what we're suggesting for New Zealand, that the government have a bank and that the money stays in New Zealand. We used to have the Bank of New Zealand, which was actually a bank in New Zealand, and the government put all its money through there, and it was a great idea. Now Westpac is the government's bank, and all the profits disappear over the Tasman. Seems almost criminal. Uh, yeah, well, you've got to be two-headed about it, Dick. If, if you go too deep, you do get a bit angry. Uh, so the challenge is to keep a clear head and also uh, understand what's going on. Well, it occurs to me that uh, with the level of understanding that people have about the monetary system now, that uh, it's going to take a bit of effort to, to bring them up to speed. But... Even more worrying for me, I guess, is that um, it seems that this way the, the money is set up now, constantly being in debt and having to pay interest and all of the profits going to the to the banksters, that, that, that what you're trying to do and what others are trying to do is to uh, remove that resource from their grasp. And yeah. to me... They won't give it up lightly, but we're part of the International Movement for Monetary Reform, and that's a group of 19 similar structured organizations around the world which are all campaigning for the same thing, government creating the money supply. Now, when we say government creating the money supply, it doesn't mean to say that government creates and spends it. No. There would be an intermediary which would say, this is how much you can create. This is how much the country can afford. And then the government would then spend that on infrastructure or on uh, a citizen's dividend or on whatever. So it would just put money into the economy. And so that's what the International Movement for Monetary Reform is all about, the IMMF. And Great strides are being made in the UK. Positive Money UK is 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 now being talked about uh, in Parliament. Um, we have Onsguild in Holland. The Dutch Parliament is going to debate money creation there, um, and there's a referendum being put forward in Switzerland for a similar thing. So this is not an isolated event. People are starting to wise up, and uh, this really is um, all that's required. If enough people know how money is created and how the banks 
are actually making their profit, then a change will be made. And that's a fine point for us to conclude this conversation about money in New Zealand. Our sincere thanks to Don Richards, the co-founder of Positive Money New Zealand. If you'd like to know more about money, check out their website at www.positivemoney.org.nz. And for more videos like this one, check out our website at deepgreenproductions.co.nz. Thanks for watching.